to. Hi, evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks live stream. Um, I think this evening is one of those Thursdays when we're in uh, conflict, probably isn't quite the right word, but with the AHS, the Antiquarian Horological Society, um, uh, broadcast or lecture, uh, which is uh, great. I always encourage people to follow those. Uh, they're available online to members after the event as well, as is uh, our live stream. So, uh, hi, Franklin and Mark. Good evening. I'm not sitting down at the moment, so got the top of my head off. Um, so, yeah, exciting uh, day today uh, because we finished this clock as far as this event is concerned anyway, and we move on to our next object, which is the torsion pendulum clock. Provided by our very own Torsion Dell. So I feel him looking over my shoulder. Um, so that's a good thing, though. Okay, so last week we finished reassembling the clock. We uh, oiled it. Uh, there were a couple of parts. Um, I couldn't find the little ring thing, the bezel, uh, but uh, it was actually inside the case. So, duh. Um, and uh, the suspension spring uh, pin had dropped out of the just the usual story. Hi, Dell. Just talking about you. Your ears must have been burning. Let's just move that across. Hi, Jeremy. Good evening. Um, yeah, the uh, the chess lecture this evening is about um, it's British clock towers as a monument of memorialization, which um, I look forward to uh, catching up with that because where our family business is in East Yorkshire, which is about 20 miles from here or thereabouts. Um, our shop, or my brother's shop now, looks out on a clock tower that was erected, I think it's a memorial to the First World War, because uh, I think it's 1936, but I don't, I'm not sure. I need to go have a look. Um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of fun. So we've got our clock uh, assembled and oiled. So before we put it in the case, um, I, hi, Ian. Nice to see you there. Um, before we put it in the case, I'm just going to quickly run around and check that I oiled all those pivots. And that's really easy to do. All you need is some low power magnification, like an eyeglass, which I've got on here, or whatever is your poison, whether it's um, a headband magnifier or a low power microscope, whatever. And you just need to um, kind of wiggle all the wheels just like this. Obviously, we've got some power on the train. And if you look into the bearings, you can see liquid oil there. Obviously, too much oil is a bad thing because it runs out of the bearings. And not enough oil is also a bad thing uh, because you don't have any lubrication. So just in case I missed anything, I'm going to spend a minute or two but I can actually see without my eyeglass that there's oil here in the um, in the center, and if necessary, top up. This actually isn't going to be the final assembly for the clock because I've seen a couple more things. Um, yeah, still on this clock, I'm afraid, Sam, but not for long. Um, we're moving on to the old uh, torsion pendulum in a in a short while. Uh, hi, Andrew. Oh well, it's lovely to see you. Um, AHS members here with how to repair pendulum clocks. Or maybe you're looking at both at once. Uh, I know how tech savvy you all are. So um, as you can see, the thing is really kind of raring to go. So very, uh, very happy with that. So I'll just, yeah. And um, not only are we on with this American clock, but uh, so here's a question. Yeah, definitely the home stretch, we've rounded the corner we're over the final hurdle. And then this is like, you know, who's gonna win? Is it gonna be the clock or is it gonna be me? I often feel that with uh, projects at the end of it. Um, I, I often think it's either it or me. And it looks like I did a pretty thorough job of, um, lashing plenty of oil on this i mean you say you say you don't want the oil running down the plates um but conversely 
and it's a, a kind of a question that um, rocks up quite a lot, comes up quite a lot. Um, okay, yeah, Sam, you'll become um, a torsion pendulum clock uh, collector addict. We uh, didn't have the money for it, but there was a Jäger, Jäger, as they call them, uh, at Moss at uh, an auction recently, locally, in its original case, it was really smart. And they're still sort of, I mean, they're expensive in a way, but they're incredibly sort of good value for money for what they are. Oh, well, there's a, a bearing that needs a little bit more oil on it. So yeah, I concede that this is maybe a useful um, role for the test stand. But I think otherwise we are good to go. Yeah. No more adjusting the pallets. It's done. It's it's fine. We got through that last week. We're we're good. We need to get onto adjusting the pallets of the torsion pendulum clock. The um just zoom in there. No, no more adjusting the pallets, regrettably. The escape wheels landing on the dead face just, and then as we've gone over it many times, but um, we have an amount of drop. It's not actually perfectly even. There's a bit more, well, it's not bad. There's a bit more internal drop than external drop, but it's not catching. So I am not going to fiddle anymore. I've um, come to the end of the road. So that's good. We can pop that back in the case. Uh, I'm actually off air going to, oops, going to, yeah, Atmos are really nice. And I remember, you know, um, however many years ago it was, not that many, when they were really not worth uh, masses of money, which always seemed a shame, but um, they are slowly kind of creeping up now. Right, okay. So I noticed uh, here, and again, I don't know what's gone wrong with my camera and focusing, but anyway. Um, that you can see here, I put this reinforcing piece of um, cotton tape on there with glue, with the hide glue, and it's made this really strong at the top. I did glue it, but I didn't do the same at the bottom. And notice it's still a little bit mobile. Um, and also there's a gap here where dust can get in. There's a big gap here at the back where dust can get in as well, but that's another story. So I'm actually going to take the movement out and reinforce this along here with cotton tape as well. And a bit of hide glue, but anyway, that will that will happen another day. I realise as well with these clocks, <laughs> because the uh, the crutch or the leader, as uh, some people call it, um, is at the front of the mechanism. It's incredibly useful to be able to take the dial off, set it in beat. I don't know how else you would do it. You'd have to probably take the movement out and then fiddle a bit then and then put it back. See if I can do this without my, no, I can't. Need a bit of Roddy Co or a bit of a, one of those uh, so-called screw grabbers. I don't have one of those. Sounds like a nightclub bouncer. Um, so yeah, uh, otherwise all good. Another clock turned up today. I think it's a bit too much like this one um, to, I use as the next live stream clock because it's uh, it's an American clock with an alarm. So I might do that as on my read repairs channel. So there's the question. Um, what's the next live stream clock? Um, it might be a bit of a gap actually after the torsion pendulum because I've got quite a few weeks of work, which is great. Okay, some bills for once, but um, yeah, anything in particular within reason that anybody wants to see? Yeah, Andrew, it is. Um, it's exactly the same thing. It's book binding. Sometimes on long case clocks, you see linen. You can buy linen scrim as a kind of window cleaning cloth, um, and you soak it in animal glue in this case, you know, because it's reversible, hide glue. Uh, but it is, it's a good question.
actually one of those things that's incredibly useful and maybe because I spend some of my time in the um so yeah there's the cotton tape and I get it from uh, as you can see there preservation equipment limited uh you buy a 100 meter roll or something and it lasts a long time um yeah really useful for packing and transportation as well uh and for book binding things like that but yeah I've always got two or three different widths of cotton tape in stock but yeah your linen um you often see it under furniture and you know inside the hood of a tall case clock uh where um uh where it all splits apart again it's really good for kind of reinforcing that and to a degree i mean you can obviously get it off whether or not it's classed as reversible or not is another thing but um right just to find the bell so again i'm congratulating myself here for once um for cleaning all these components months and months and months ago when i first took them off otherwise for me being a lazy person um the temptation would be to just put them on as they were so uh, as you know i'm a big fan of We'll have to see what that sounds like uh, when it's actually in place, but it seems okay. And then we'll somewhere here, we've got our cathedral gong. Um, oh, good. Well, that's really kind, Mark. Thank you. Um, I'm learning a lot as well doing it. Uh, and I know people um, think that's a bit of a joke, but I actually do. Uh, I and mean, I've had the... Um, privilege of teaching this kind of stuff yeah, quite a long time ago now um and of course it's that old joke with the students that the only difference in terms of what you learn between the student and the teacher is one of you gets paid and the other one pays but that is actually <laughs> it's kind of true so i were um, gone i washed it all i did it with uh, steel wool and you can see here got um there's still a little bit of very light surface rusting so I'm just going to, I'll just heat up the camera a bit. I'm just going to do it with a bit of uh, Renaissance wax just to try and kind of slow down um, the rate of rusting with my trusty Glasgow brush. And again, I'm using the wrong one because this is the one for brushing off wax, as you can see, not for brushing it on, but there you go. Those are the days of luxury where I used to have two brush, you know, brush one, you put it on and one, you take it off. But um so Andrew, uh, Mark is laid back about, uh, relaxed about which kind of clock we do. And um, anybody got any uh, views? We've done a single train fusey clock, haven't we? We've done an eight day long case clock. We did the fusey clock on there, um, whatever they call it. Uh, clock club, was it? I uh, can't remember, clock club, I think. Uh, so uh, 30 hour long case, tall case clock. Uh, French clock, Pondule, got hundreds of them. That would be quite fun. Anyway, if anybody's got any um, ideas, then let me know. There we are. So we've just put a bit of uh, microcrystalline wax on that. We just retard the rusting. Yeah. Exciting this uh, part of the process. Um, and I put a new, I, I think I showed it on uh, Facebook, I put a new leather insert in the hammer there. I got some leather for um, here, four millimeter diameter leather kind of band uh, that I was using for a French clock repair. And that fitted in, it was a little bit big. I had to shave some off with a scalpel but um we got there and then it was a bit squidgy so i uh just painted it with um shellac to uh toughen it up a little bit right anna three train chime oh, yeah well that's a good um a good idea, Jeremy. Well, we would definitely be learning together there because um, I've done them in the past. I've done, um, say done, 
worked on quite a lot of it sounds really pompous three train sort of um you know english fusey clocks but very few uh sort of westminster um, French clocks as a part of the clocks here. Yeah. yeah, and the, um, very few kind of Smiths. It would be actually quite, in, I'd be pretty interested in doing um, an Enfield, in working on an Enfield three train. Never, well, not in this part of my life, never worked on one. So we've got our passing striking now. And um, new opinion for a French clock we made. Okay, that's beyond my workshop capacity, I'm afraid, Sam. But, um, uh get on to um darren on the facebook group he's uh seems a super keen uh maker restorer so i'm sure if he's working on one he'll knock one out for you um a bit of pinion cutting yeah and french clock's quite small isn't it um mm, one of my students once made a escape wheel uh pinion for a marine chronometer which was impressive made their own cutter tiny little a uh, tiny little thing. I don't have any wheel cutting facilities, so can't um, oblige there. But get on to uh, get on to Darren on the Facebook group and ask him to knock one out. So the gong needs to be nice and tight to prevent it from vibrating. And now what we can do, if we can, I don't know if you'd love to see or not. Lighting is all a bit dodgy in there. Well, let's just try moving the hands on and see if it actually works. Give it a bit of a wind. French clock, okay. Oh, we've got some good suggestions there. French clock is... Um, it's great, no problem with that at all. We can, we did on, again, I think it was, um, I think it was uh, Open Clock Club, was it? We did a bit on French clocks, but, um, oh, hi, afternoon from Ontario. So let's just see if this actually works, the striking. Nice. I don't know what the sound is like there through the camera. Cool. Okay. Oh, we've got enough suggestions there to keep us going all year. So the three train clock um, uh, and French clocks and making opinion. If I happen to find a lathe, and I keep looking for lathes every day, but there's just nothing. Every time I look, I get despondent and think I'll get my third and then I don't and uh, then I look at shoveling one or twos again and then they're 20 grand and then so I'm going nowhere with that anyway I need a bigger workshop so so there we go our striking I think is good our striking on the gong yeah you're right uh, Sam a three train I will look out for a un uncleaned and unrepaired unrestored uh smith enfield three train if i get one um belonging to a client as well uh sort of for overhaul i'll show you that but um you know with the old uh english style quarter striking good i think uh, i can't put that off any longer it's actually working much to my amazement so we're all reassembled there uh, I'm not going to put the dial on yet because I want to set it in beat. So let's just put the fingers on. Oops. Wherever they are. So it's count wheel striking. So as um, most of you will know, count wheel as opposed to rack striking is a sequential system. So it strikes one followed by two followed by three followed by four and you can't shortcut that system so when we put the hands on all we're actually interested in is um the fact that it's on in the correct position in relation to the half hours so let's just try it we know that um our hand needs to go on a bit further we know that our 
uh, passing striking is on the half hour. So it's all a bit wobbly. Ah. Sometimes the gloves are a pain. We'll see. Um, Oh, and more people from uh, Ontario. Great. Good, 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 good. Very pleased to... Um... Right, okay, so that's the hour. So 12, I lost count. Yay, cool. So that must be half past 12. So we know we can put our hand on there. We don't care about the hour position because we can either just trip the striking mechanism to advance it. Um, there isn't actually a little pull string, but you could easily fit one to this, or we can move the hour hand around. There's various ways of uh, synchronizing count wheel striking. So I never thought I would see the day, but it might not look like it, but we're actually getting to the point where it's done. A little bit of knurling on that nut. So this might be one o'clock. Our hand still is in the way. Half past one, just move that back even more. Give ourselves a bit of clearance. Two o'clock and so on. So that wants to be somewhere up around there. So that's great. So I think we can hook on our pendulum and check that it runs. Just one thing here, um, which I meant to point out that uh, We've obviously had this thing, get a pair of tweezers. Totally uh, in bits. And um, you have to kind of check everything and check everything 10 times, of course. But interesting point here is that um, this cropped up on the Facebook group that the uh, crutch or leader loop here, or fork in a, the case of a French clock, it's not a completely closed like circle, it's just a fork needs to be, need, no such thing as should, must, or auto, as close a fit as you can reasonably make it. Any slot there is going to be a loss of energy, but it mustn't bind. Now, my granddad um, always used to say that there should be plenty slot there. I'm not quite sure what he was talking about, or even if he was talking about clocks. Uh, but one thing you can do, so the, the beauty of this is, of course, in order to, um, I suppose you could do it on a, on a regular clock, but in order to close up the gap, don't squeeze the loop because it will end up being uh, non-parallel um, and it'll jam or be too slack. Just as you can see what I've done here is just to bend it at an angle. And um, of course that reduces the effective width of the slot, slot without having to, uh, to bend the loop. And then, always put a little bit of gloopy oil on either side. I always joke, this, this acts as a bit of a viscose coupling. There's some fur on there. But what it, actually, well, what it does as well is it quietens it all down so it's not rattling away. Make sure that that's pushed back. And I reckon we are good to go. So I'll just turn my back on you. Just pop that up there. Come sa, find our pendulum. Maybe I can stand on this side. Yeah, kind of. Let me down from the inside.
There we are. So if you can, maybe you can't even see that. It's a bit far away, isn't it? But I'll post some pictures on the Facebook group. Um, let me just think about this. Maybe I shouldn't muck about with it anymore. As I said, it's time. But it's uh, it's running. Lo and behold, it is running. Let's just... Cable's probably not long enough. Uh, it's not going to, uh, the camera bracket's not going to hold up. Anyway, there you go. It is uh, going for it there. So that's pretty cool. Very pleased with that. All right, let's just get this camera back on. Something like that. That'll do. So just one last little job to do, uh, and then we can leave it. And that's just to um, glue in this glass. So I cleaned the glass, cleaned the dial, spent quite a lot of time on that, repaired the hinge, you name it, we did it. So the glass, which I was worried that it was going to break when we took it out, is fine. Well, so far, anyway, don't speak too soon. And it's retained by this little uh, wire clip thing here and whether it was originally done like that I presume it was um it was had blobs of soft solder on it one there one there one there and one there under my I don't know anyway it had some blobs of soft solder on it which I took off in the normal way of heating it gently with a spirit lamp and then getting a brush this brush here a bit damp and just brushing it off I don't want to put soft solder back on it what I do want to use is another one of my um, so-called conservation products and that's uh, a glue or adhesive called Paraloid B72. This is Paraloid B72. You buy it in, um, in uh, granules uh, normally and you mix it with acetone or something like that but you can buy it from this company called HMG and um, it's pre-mixed. So I'm just going to put some two or three little blobs on there and then leave that to um, dry or cure or set or whatever they call it. And the good thing about the paraloid is that it's not particularly strong actually, which is, you might think that's a bad thing, but it's actually in my view, a good thing in this case, it doesn't have to be massively strong. Um, it's got reasonable uh, cohesive qualities. It's adhesive qualities are not amazing, but this isn't difficult making a complete pig zero that, uh, that will do. There we go. So leave that for an hour. After it, it um, goes off quite quickly. It's got acetone as it's uh, solvent and put that somewhere where it won't get broken. Up there. With our screws which are there and I think that is done so thank you for bearing with us um what time is it okay oh that was good half an hour great um great good uh little clocks ticking away oh it's got to set it to time I keep looking at the AHS thing wondering whether Google clock tower is going to come up I doubt it well 1851 
There we go. So effect time as well. Can't really tell without the hands, but uh, there you go. Okay, so here we have da -da, da -da, our next bit of joy, our clock, which I should have probably gotten out. I opened the box to see what it was and check it was okay, not kind of broken or anything, because that would have been embarrassing and pretty awful. Um, but um, what I haven't done is uh, to actually see what's inside the box. So this is a genuine um, unveiling here, super exciting. Uh, right, okay. I presume that's got um, the suspension spring in it, I guess. Nicely packed. Thank you, Dell. Wow, exciting. Gosh, it's a long time since I worked on one of these. How difficult can it be? Super, super job with the packing. Right, okay, the pendulum's there. Oh, don't think there's anything in there, it's just a box. Good, 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 good. Right, okay. So there are our suspension blocks, a live unboxing, yeah, and a, and a kind of real unboxing. I've slightly taken myself by surprise because what I wanted to do, I've been writing reports all day, which has been really boring. Um, but what I wanted to do is to kind of go through this and uh, check that it wasn't any kind of crazy surprises in there, but there you go. It's a real deal. Just make sure nothing's dropped off in the packing. There's a in there, I think that's it. Okay, so maybe uh, Derek, if you're there. Um, oh, that gong just sounds like it's it's just how it sounds. I think it's a bit uh, a bit in there. Maybe you can tell us about this clock. So the dial doesn't appear to be signed, but the backplate is signed. That's Coma K O M A. Nice. And uh, that's it, really. It's in the condition that I like them, not polished up, just needs taking apart, cleaning, and putting back together again. So your challenge, I think, with a clock like this is, obviously, if you're going to buy one and you're going to, I mean, again, I'm sure uh, Derek will add in the comments if he's got anything to say about it. If you're going to buy one, get one that hasn't been worked on uh you know one that's just sat on somebody's mantelpiece and uh, it's sat there for 40 or 50 years and nothing's happened to it because you know that there's gonna be no bent teeth no bent pivots the mainspring's gonna be fine um and so on and i think it's actually pretty straightforward the difficulty seems to come you need to make sure everything's clean cleaner than you would with uh, a clock like that behind, which obviously is not sealed and you will get away with a lot of, um, not get away with a lot loss of energy. But with this, this is very much more watch-like in the sense that you need everything to be clean. I know that Derek, uh, um, <laughs> I know that Derek uh, sometimes doesn't lubricate the mobiles. I am gonna lubricate everything but either very lightly or with um, watch oil, particularly in the top of the train, where if you put thick oil on there, it's just gonna stop it because it's just gonna gloop everything up. Might just actually have a bit of a change of lens here for fun, just to show you the escapement. I'll just have a little look and see whether it's ticking or not. No, it's not. And I don't know whether that's because Derek took all the power off the train or whether it's actually run down. Notice I haven't found a winding key yet. And I don't suppose there's going to be one inside that tube. So just look for a winding key and um, see if I can find one that fits. Yeah. 
I don't know what the original winding keys are like for these clocks. Obviously, pretty small. It looks about two and a half, three mil French clock key might fit it. Too big, like a carriage clock key. So I'll need to measure it and uh, buy a key, just a little butterfly key. No. No, 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 no. Hmm. On somewhere, for sure. You would think I'm a, oh, there's one. Looks promising. Great. So before I go and wind crazy and break something. All oh, right, okay. Derek says he does always um, oil them and make sure that the eccentric bush hasn't been touched, which we'll get onto uh, later. So, yeah, so there's a bit of um, tension on the spring. You can, I think you heard then or not, but um, there was somebody on the Facebook group talking about a noisy spring or one that kind of went, uh, you know, when you, when it's running down. Nice key, by the way. It's not bad, is it? It's like a little fusy clock key. Wouldn't mind the clock that that used to belong to. And um, and uh, that's a sign of a dry spring. But again, for me, uh, I know people have different views on this stuff. Um, and one of the things I'm really looking forward to doing is cleaning the glass. That'll be good fun. Is, um, is by, if you're beginning, hi, Ken. Great, you can join us. Uh, is to buy a clock that's complete. And I know people say buy movements, sort of scrap movements and things from the internet. The problem with um, that is I don't see how you can get the satisfaction that we've just had, if you can call it satisfaction, with this clock where you put it all together and it runs and you say, ta-da. And I want, you know, maybe it's just me, but I want that kind of, end thing where you give the clock away or you sell it or something happens to it um and you never get that with the mechanism so for me i would always buy a complete clock like this uh, i presume dell took the suspension spring off there but otherwise it's um it's all together it just it's got things like uh, here look is some brasso so somebody's cleaned it with uh, brasso which is great i uh, tried to shine it up a bit no problem with that whatsoever so i'm not doing this uh today but what i'd normally do and totally advise you to do if this is a new type of clock for you is to photograph everything um it's really difficult to know where you've gotten to if you don't make a record of it you can't see your progress i'd photograph everything that way as well you know what goes where and the same thing I did with that clock is I would start, and I will do, maybe not live on air, but at the outside and work your way in. That way, when you come to reassemble the clock, everything's nice and clean. So I'll clean the glass, uh, take the pendulum completely apart. I don't know whether Derek, you do that. Um, it's got some pins in there that might be rivets. I don't know. Mm, kind of. I don't know whether it will come completely apart or not. And uh, wash that. And then otherwise, your only major challenge from the other clocks we've looked at is setting up the escapement. So I'll just look for, just check it's actually running through now. I've wound it a little bit. No, still not. That's interesting because I've wound it. Quite a bit and there's no power at all at the escape wheel. And it could be that it's just dirty and it's completely dry. Obviously we'll have to let the spring down again. A little bit um, of a separate challenge in letting the springs down on 
these. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get some oil just to get things moving a bit. Uh, where's my oil gone? Can't be far. Famous last words. Hmm. Hmm. Oh well, that was a nice idea. Might just put some of this really gloopy stuff on. Might actually um, need a bush in the bottom of this by the look of it. There's a, some where well, maybe that's why power's not getting through to the escapement. I wound it quite a bit, and oh, it is now a bit of a bit of oil in the lower part of the train that's got it going. So I'll just go uh, change the lens and then, um, all right, okay. So Derek says, Yeah, take the pendulum apart. I agree. I would do that first and then it's done again all uh kind of long case clocks and things the number of times you go and look at clocks and somebody's dealt with the top call it what you want but then the client can't regulate the clock because the um pendulum bob is seized up or um Yeah, if there's any problem exciting uh, and damage, any um, thing with the sound, I think it's just broadcasting through YouTube and Zoom. It compresses the sound such a lot. Sounds really grim. So yeah, there's a little challenge with letting the spring down, which we will do in a, in a minute. But I'll just have a quick change of lenses and see if you can see the escapement. So it's essentially a deadbeat escapement here. Uh, well, it is a deadbeat escapement. Um, it's akin to a Roscoff pin pallet escapement that you'd find in an alarm clock or in a less expensive watch. And um, so it has, unlike the, um, well, in fact, not unlike this thing behind us, unlike the anchor recall escapement, it has a distinct impulse phase and it has a distinct uh, locked phase. And I don't know whether there's draw on the pallets. On a jeweled lever watch, um, you get something called draw on the pallets, which is a kind of a, a part of the locking, which prevents the lever from unlocking if you happen to jolt the watch. I'm not sure that's the case here. Oh, well, Derek says he's never had to rebush a clock, so that's good, because I can't stand doing bushing anyway. No, it doesn't look like there's any draw on the pallets. It looks like it's just dead. So it's a deadbeat escapement, but with pin pallets. So tiny little weeny um, bits of hardened steel. And they're all, well, I, I shouldn't say they're all the same because I've got no idea. We may lose the camera for a bit. Play the ball. Yay. Right. Okay. So it's about as close as we're going to be able to get it. No chance of any focusing would be useful. Yeah, there we are. I'll just warm it up a bit because it's a little bit underexposed there we go bit brighter cool so hopefully what you can see here let's just go through the train let's spend a bit of time and also that's a good um that's a good opportunity for me to kind of re-familiarize myself and make it up as i go along as always so like uh, a regular kind of mantle clock 
we've got a barrel here, mainspring barrel, uh, contains our spring and like uh, the Enfield clock or something, the great wheel is cut um, directly onto the edge of the barrel there. So that's all pretty straightforward. Um, the, so a torsion pendulum clock, and I don't know if I'm allowed to call it this, but they're sometimes called anniversary clocks or 400 day clocks. So they're long duration clocks and they achieve long duration in two ways. One is by uh, the fact that the uh, pendulum has got a relatively low frequency. Um, and the other one is because they've got more wheels in the train. If you put more wheels at the bottom end of the train, um, between the center wheel, for instance, and the barrel, then you get longer duration for a given number of turns of the spring. But if you do that, you also need more energy, proportionally more energy. So everything here has got to be just that little bit nicer made and finely adjusted and so on. Hence my uh, thing before about make sure you don't buy one that's been gotten at before. So we've actually got, um, I think it's two wheels here, isn't it? Between the, um, three wheels. Okay, so we've got three, if you look at um, like a mantle clock, we've got three additional wheels here uh, between the barrel. So we've got our um, three intermediate wheels, one, one down there, one there and one uh, here. And all they do is that they uh, drive the center. The, so the center wheel is, get my tweezers in there, under there, look. That's the one that's got our hand on it. If we wibble that, you can see the hand moving at the front. So normally um, in a eight day clock, like an Enfield, you'd have one lower intermediate uh, intermediate um, wheel. Oh, Derek said they did a thousand day clock. My God, crazy. And uh, I can imagine, um, I've seen those French clocks with multiple, multiple barrels that run for a year as well. So basically, this is half of the uh, deal of why these are long duration. These, uh, so you normally have this wheel here. But this wheel would normally drive straight into your centre wheel. So you've got two additional wheels there. So you're basically changing from uh, a week duration to um, a month's duration and a month's duration to a year duration. Let's kind of rough it out like that. Plus the fact that we've got our uh, long uh, period of oscillation. So otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. We've got um, friction work. Um, underneath the dial, which we'll look at in a bit, just like a regular clock. Then we've got an intermediate wheel, which is uh, around this side, flip it around. So there's our upper intermediate wheel. And you can see even though I've wound it, it's very little pressure on there, because of course it's all geared down. The torque is proportional to the ratio, less uh, the amount of friction that we've got. So it looks like there's a lot going on there, but it's not too bad. So let's just operate this escapement and have a little look. So if we look, uh, I need a smaller pointy stick. American clock still running, amazing. I always say when I fix clocks like that, there's a kind of, um, a, a, you know, first five minutes are always nerve wracking, but then you've kind of got this thing of uh, three hours, three days, three weeks, and three months um, are the kind of the, seem to be the critical points. And the three months one is an interesting one. Why the clocks stop after three months? Um, most of them stop after three months because of bushing, uh, don't do any bushing basically, but bushing that's not uprighted or a bit tight or a burr. And so when you oil the clock, it runs fine. You take it back to the client, but that bearing slowly, slowly picks up. And as the oil spreads out a bit, evaporates a bit, um, it stops basically, binds, uh, it binds up. So I think that I'm just looking around for something to 
pop this on. Um, I've got my blocks actually. Sorry, I'm looks like I'm looking for distractions, which I am. So the fact that it's run half an hour is, I think we're good there. These blocks, let's just lift it up a little bit. Turn that round, pull some focus. There we go. Okay. So uh, we've got our escape wheel and it's rotating uh, counterclockwise as you're looking at it there. Now we can see. Just like all the other escapements we've looked at on Open Cloud Club and the live stream and on Facebook group, we've got an entry palette and we've got an exit palette. Okay, so our entry palette is on this side, that little sticking out blue steel pin there, and our exit palette is on this side. Well, you can see the big difference is that the escape wheel teeth, as Derek said uh, in the... Um, in the um, in the chat, yeah, it's a pin palette escapement, like a Roscoff escapement, but it's a form of deadbeat escapement. So we've got those two phases, which you can see quite clearly there. And this is key to setting the thing up, because uh, getting a 400 day clock or a torsion pendulum clock, having it in beat is incredibly useful because you can observe how much amplitude there is after the clock has escaped. Now we talked months and months ago about escaping arc and supplementary arc. And that's really important with this clock. So there's an amount of amplitude of the pendulum that you need for the clock to escape, for the escapement to run. So if we just wibble this about a little bit, you can see, I can do it without shaking too much. So you can see our entry palette there is on uh, the impulse space of a tooth. So the, the pendulum's getting impulse there. And just like every other statement, it drops off and the exit palette is now on the dead face and that locks. So that, that locks in the bottom of the tooth. And then as it's just in there and the pendulum continues to rotate. So when we have finished cleaning this clock, will be very interested in that supplementary arc. I don't know, again, Derek, maybe you can uh, advise us as to what kind of overall amplitude we'd be looking at for a clock like this. Um, obviously, all you need is some, but the more you can get within reason, the kind of safer the whole thing is going to be. Um, because inevitably with a clock like this, unless it's on a very, very solid surface, never have them on like, little side tables and things because they will stop um, and, and people move them for dusting and all that kind of stuff. So you want that to be within reason as much supplementary arc as you can get. So let's just run through this a couple more phases. If I can without breaking it. So our exit palette is locked. The pendulum swings back in the direction, and then we're now on the impulse face of the exit palette. And if you look, wait for drop. There's drop, and the entry palette is now on the dead face. And you can see it's dead because when we wibble the palette about there, the escape wheel doesn't rotate. There is neither impulse nor uh, recoil. So there we go. So actually, unlike a regular clock, watching that escapement when we get the thing finished, it's going to be really useful for us setting it up. Okay. So everything's nice here, as you can see. These things are really nicely made. Um, not unlike a French clock in that respect of these quite high quality pinions, and everything's fine. But you've got not a massive room for error in terms of uh, dirt, bent teeth, and so on and so forth, which you will get away with, with um, a clock like the American clock that we've just worked on. Cool. 
Cool. Okay. So let's just encourage that across there. Try and find the middle of the thing. And put that up there. Oh, I see why. Just need to throttle that back a bit. Okay, good. How many beats per minute are there? Good question, Sam. I've got no idea. Can you answer that question? Uh, Del, how many, what's the period of, of uh, road period of this pendulum? Okay. We could do a train count. That would be a fun thing to do. Uh, let's, um, I must remind myself to do that. When we've got it apart, let's do a train count because you can do, train count is incredibly useful. Like with any clock, you can find out how many beats per minute, second or hour there are which would be kind of useful, I suppose, to regulate it as well. So before we start taking it apart, I wonder if there's anything else that's kind of noteworthy. Um, we can get it down from that thing now. Uh, have a look underneath. Okay, so we've got um, this lever here, which is a locking mechanism for the pendulum. So when we look up here, the pendulum doesn't rest in this cup when the clock is running. This isn't a bearing. We look underneath. There's a little pointy thing down there. But what it does do is that when you lock that, there's a little kind of eccentric cam, a bit like rising butts on door hinges. See that? So that moves up and it locks the pendulum. And I thought it locked the pendulum against... Uh, a kind of bracket that was on here, but that doesn't either appear to be fit to this clock or it's not here. So let's just have a look. Right, okay. So either the bracket is missing, is the bracket missing? Um, or is it not meant to be there? I don't know. Anyway, so that's what that does anyway. And then you've got tripod feet, of course, which makes complete sense because it can never rock. And then all you do with the feet when you set the clock up is screw them all in like this. And then you pop the clock down and then just adjust the two back ones and the front one if necessary to get that pendulum uh, roughly in the middle of the well uh, at the back. I love this uh, pressed steel, nice color underneath. Um, yeah, it's all cool. I like the fact it's not being cleaned up. So that's all good. So. Otherwise, there isn't a whole lot here that is significantly different other than the suspension spring. So suspension spring on a regular clock is something that we tend not to think much about uh, until it uh, breaks. And then we just buy a new one, stick it on, and then you regulate that out. With a 400-day clock, the suspension spring is really probably, I would say, the, the number one kind of issue obviously because they're thin and long and they get bent and broken and people spin the pendulum around like a carousel uh, and that's it basically but also they're very sensitive to the position not only of the blocks so there's the top block a bottom block I think that's the right way around or is that the top block and that's the bottom block and then um, this fork here so the fork engages with the uh, pin on the pallet arbor just get a So as a cleaning, I'm just going to clean this exactly the same as I would any other clock. I'm going to use um, paraffin as a first kind of wash. And then I'm going to rinse it in watch rinsing solution, which is a spirit based watch rinse. I take it the springs in here so I'll get my scalpel out. Chop my finger off. And uh, peg it out as always, you know, peg out the bearing holes, whack it together, take the spring out of the barrel and um, see how it runs. Now, in the past, and um, yeah, I don't know whether that this clock, um, oh, it has had that. Maybe it's inside this tube. I don't know. I'm not opening it yet. But yeah, these two screws here, they are for where there's a tube. Um, that goes on the back that protects the suspension spring. Thank you, Franklin. No, just a spring in here. 
been there quite a long time. It doesn't want to come out, and I don't blame it. So um, what you can do, and I know Derek has said before that he's a fan of keeping the blocks, and I totally get that because I'm a fan of keeping everything. Oh, there's our clock striking. It actually sounds all right in here. It, I, I probably through the video, it's a bit grim. Yay, actually works. And actually struck the right number of blows. So super happy with that. Um, but you can uh, buy new springs complete with new blocks that are already set to what is believed to be the correct lens. But I guess because Dell has sent me blocks and a spring there, um, he wants me to try and repair it. So there's a challenge because I'm not sure I've ever done that before. I probably have and just ended up. All oh, right, okay, the spring guard's missing. Great, okay, solve that mystery. So um, this spring here is presumably a new spring by the look of it. It's um, the springs are um, Elinvar. Um, so they are um, of no change or very little change in the coefficient of elasticity with given change in temperature. So this is a nickel iron, some posh nickel iron alloy. So it's a special kind of steel, basically, um, that remains, uh, yeah, a constant or near constant um, coefficient of elasticity with change in temperature. It's not actually, you might think it's the change in length with temperature that's a killer, but it's actually the elasticity. Change in length does have an effect but on something like a marine chronometer, I think the change in length is only about 10% of the error. It's a change in elasticity with change in temperature that causes the problems. So um, let's just assess where we are. So we've got this to clean and assemble. That's one thing, it's got tape on it, so it'll be a bit sticky, uh, no problem. The other thing is the pendulum to clean and disassemble, which is really something for kind of offline. So I need to find a tray and I'm in a bit of a um, crisis over trays at the moment because despite repairing clocks for a long time, um, I still haven't gotten sorted out with project trays. I quite like the really useful box type things. Um, but I've got a bit of a problem with project trays because the problem with a project tray, so that's a, like a deep tray with a lid on that you can put in a set of drawers, is that it makes you, <laughs> tends to make you take things apart and leave them in bits, um, which I do that anyway. So let's get some uh, acid free tissue to go in here. Now, I remember um, at primary school, we used to have these nice wooden drawers with plastic, quite deep plastic trays in them. So maybe something like that is the answer. Or maybe the answer is just don't continually take locks apart and not put them back together again. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get my, because that tape is going to get sticky and everything. I'm going to get my benzene jar. I'm going to put these blocks, um, <coughs> pardon me, to soak in a bit of uh, watch rinse just to get the sticky off them and start cleaning them up. And also they're safe in there. They won't get lost or they won't get too lost anyway. There we go and get rid of that tape. That's cool. That's out the way. There was a tape pin as well, which is there. Not sure that's anything to do with it, but... Is there a pin missing from there? Oh, yeah, it is. There's a pin missing there, look, from the dial foot. So that's good. Pop that in there. Get that spring so it can't get bent. Good. Okay. So let's just move this to one side. And we can... No room for anything. Mm. 
Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. Mm. And we can start to have a look at this. Show me the fork. I can tell you how many beats per minute. Oh, okay, the fork. I don't know what that is. It's big enough on there for you to be able to see it. Or even in focus. I guess what we can always do as well is, um, I mean, we obviously know that the uh, length of the pendulum has to fit in here. So that's going to help us with that spring. That spring is obviously far too long. And also we can um, set the pendulum at about half its uh, radius. So, you know, the, the pendulum works by the mass moving in and out like an ice skater, uh, conservation of angular momentum. So we can deal with that and then we can check whether we're in the ballpark. And we will know because we will, I oh yeah, the dial feet, uh, dial feet pins are dropping out. We'll know because we um, can do a train count. So let's just have a look. Okay. So we've got a knurled nut here uh, holding the hands on. Get my... Just the, sorry about the um, noise in the background. We've got a kind of party going on. Just under that nailed note with uh, glass line pliers. Cut off. Okay, call it there. There's a hand call it. There's our minute hand. Just get the hour hand off in the normal way, twist it off. It just fits on a little, um, you know, it's just on a regular thing like that. That all wants to go in the benzene jar too. The cleaning. Yeah, the big difference in terms of cleaning is once it's washed and rinsed, um, everything's got to be kept dust free or as dust free as I can. And obviously you can see everything as well, which um, there's our bits. Really useful benzene jars and sort of like quite expensive for what they are. Let's just get that pin out because it's irritating. Um, there must be a third one somewhere. There's one at the top. It's an early clock. 12 beats a minute. Cool. Oh, that's quite good. That's quite lively then. And pre-1968, like me, I'm pre-1968. Just trying to break it too much. Lovely. 12 beats a minute. So there's our dial. Again, it's got this really nice uh, kind of sprayed gilt pin finish on there. I don't think this is disassemblable. It's pressed together. Maybe you could if you wanted. And again, this lovely uh, painted surface, really nice. Unfortunately, it's been gotten out a bit in the middle, but I'm not bothered about that. So I'll just wash this in the normal way with a bit of um, deionized water and some Volpex soap and probably that uh, product called so um, soap sponge, smoke sponge, which is a paper conservators thing. Well, I'm very excited that it might be the same age as me. So this is a uh, smoke sponge. It's a natural rubber sponge that you uh, use with um, water-based solvents. And it's really 
uh, soft, so you can just lift off some of this kind of discoloration. So I'll give that a good old uh, wash. That's great. Enjoy our tray. And then let's have a look under here. So the motion work is obviously, uh, oh, somebody unfortunately has, it looks a lot worse on the camera than it is in reality. They've scratched across, scratched across the plate, had a bit of a, a slip there. Anyway, um, so the normal thing here, 12 to one reduction ratio, so we've got an hour wheel, which is held on by this screw. There's a little friction spring behind there, I think. Otherwise, I've got no idea how the hands carry. So let's just get a watch maker's screwdriver. Nothing yet too scary. I think that that's good. I wasn't fit the slot. Oh, it does. I see. Okay, good. Oh, well, there's our first little uh, challenge because again, I haven't not got uh, probably the lens away now. Well, you can see here that um, there's half the screws broken away. So we've just got the slot, uh, which and the screws loose. That's why the screwdriver wouldn't go in the slot because there isn't really a slot there. You can see that. So um, we can either put a new screw on and make a screw if you've got the right uh, tap, a die, sorry, um, or we can just live with it as it is. Uh, you could um, file, because this screw doesn't do much. Um, I mean, it just holds the minute wheel on. Uh, it shouldn't be loose, of course, like it was, but um, you could just cut another slot across at 90 degrees, which some people would regard as a bit of a bodge um or you or just tighten it up as it is or you could actually file some of it away and make a new slot running across there um it's not holding up the anything so well it's holding up something but not a great deal so let's just encourage that out so as much as it's um had uh it looks like it's not been got out much it's got a bit of um you know use and interesting, how on earth does that screw ever get broken like that? Because it certainly doesn't need to be tight. Well, it needs to be tight enough not to come undone. Don't forget to let the mainspring down. Don't forget to set the mainspring down. That would be uh, that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? So letting the mainspring down on these is a little bit more uh, challenging than a regular clock. Because if you look on the back and look on the front, there's no click. The click is uh, between the plates. So you've got to fiddle about in there, but again, in the same way. Right, okay. So there's our um, screw with a broken head. If you've got, it looks about M1.5. I guess it'll be metric with it being German. Um, you can probably buy them from the watch house or something i don't know or you could just make one maybe we'll try and make one uh try and just um again as a ba thread is it wow oh, okay oh well in which case then i've got no excuse it'll be um 10 ba maybe 12 ba something like that i don't know okay well if it's a ba thread we can make uh, a new screw he says just like yeah like that but not too difficult got a watch make a slave there's our um, minute wheel. I should check these really for damage given that that screw was broken. Yeah, it's fine, I think. So it's um, cycloidal gearing, but it's got uh, rounded bottoms to the teeth like a watch. So for extra strength, the kind of continental way of doing it. There's our, our wheel, which on our, our hand goes on. Oh, I see. So the friction on this is um, like a French clock. Okay, got it. So there's our hour wheel. No problem there as far as I can see. Pop that in a little jar. And then here's our kind of wheel. So it doesn't have um, a little boat spring, a little friction spring, but it's got this um, cannon pinion, just like a watch or a bit like a French clock. 
So uh, this drives the uh, minute wheel, and then it's got a little square on the end uh, onto which the hand sits. And basically this reduced diameter here uh, is squeezed in a little bit um, to grip the center arbor. So if you tighten these, don't just squeeze it in like that because it'll uh, it'll never fit properly again, but make a pin, file up a brass pin that actually supports it from the inside. And for watches, there's a tool called a pan cannon pinion tightening tool um, with this. I don't know how it's done, whether it's done with a, sometimes there's a, a little single pip, but actually it looks like it just pushes on. Mm. Which is interesting because there's absolutely no friction there and no sign of there any friction. So is it, Derek, that there's meant to be a friction spring there and it's missing? Is it sometimes a curled spring? Um, am I missing something here? Or has somebody just disassembled it and not put the, the spring back? All right, okay. So it looks like there's something been touching the back of the cannon pipe. Might just be the center. Right, okay, so there's something missing there. I don't know whether it's a little curved brass spring or whether it's a um, helical spring, but you need some way of making friction between the um, between the cannon pipe like this, and it's not being squeezed in the middle. There's no indication that it's ever been squeezed in. So um, there's something missing. So whoever, I don't know, who knows what happened in the past. We need to make something or find something or uh, deal with that. Okay, so let's look at our uh, winding work. As Derek said, with any spring-driven clock, absolutely critical to let the power off the spring safely. So there's our winding ratchet in there. Um, I'm actually going to take the little movement off the thing. Very loose again, these uh, little boat, seat board bolt type things. So presumably somebody's struggled with it. Let's hope they haven't been inside the train. So there's a couple of little knurled uh, seat board bolt type devices that just lifts off there. So we can clean all that up. Fingerprints. Tut, 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 always wear gloves. Um, and then underneath here, we've got a so we've got, um, you can see, uh, ratchet click spring here, blued steel, which folds back on itself. The click is there that's the tail of the click it just it's a bit gloomy in there and then the ratchet wheels there so the good thing about this is the side of the movement none of the train wheels stick out he says no just inside so we can plonk it down like that and we can let off the power um nice and easily now uh, i would say when you're dealing with springs always wear safety gloves and eye protection I'm not sure with this thing, it's not much bigger than a pocket watch that I would need to do that, but um, I should say that anyway. But what I do wonder is whether my uh, mainspring letdown uh, thing, kit tool, has got one that's uh, small enough. We'll find out. If not, then what I would say was make one. We could use the key, but using the key is pretty bad practice. So, smallest one. I presume they make these sets, so there is one that fits. But maybe not. Nope. Well, there you go. Uh, so that's the smallest one, so-called number two, and it's uh, no good. So that's uh, scuppered that plan. So what I can do while we're doing for time, it's 20 past. Um, 
Yeah, because I'm probably not going to get the spring out tonight. Interesting to note that the yeah usual story. That's not too bad actually. Winding squares a little bit um, damaged. It's not. It's not too bad. But again, obviously you get that with um, using the uh, so-called wrong uh, diameter key or wrong a square across squares key. So you could take the pallets out here and take those two screws out to the back cock off uh, and let the thing run down. But I'd prefer to do it so-called properly and let the spring down. But I don't have a let down tool. I could use the key, but it's uh, you always, even with this, you know, you it's reasonably strong. You run the chance of letting go with a key, flies around, damages your fingers, or probably in this case, it'll damage a great wheel tooth or something. So I'll uh, measure up with my me too. So let's have a measure up. So I'll uh, order a couple of brass keys, one which I'll use for the winding key and the other one which I will use, make into a letdown tool, which there is an amazing video that I made. So it's 2.4. I guess you'd have to get one that was two and a half mil. You could get 2.25 and open it up with them. Um, uh, with um, my, hmm, let's have a look. Might have one. In the never-ending quest for um, tools, I found the oil. So let's just have a look at these Enfield uh, hand things. They were 2.25, they're too small. Oh well, what's that? 2.25. So I can either be lazy and order two keys, but I need to order one anyway, or I can get a file and I can open this up, but I think I'll just order two keys. So I think we'll probably leave it there today. So that's super exciting. Uh, we, a little bit more work to do on our clock case, but it is ticking away like a good one. So considering that escapement and the escape wheel, it just runs in and out a beat a little bit because of those damaged escape wheel teeth, but absolutely fine got really good amplitude it's not fully wound uh it's struck so when the paraloid on the um, glass is dried then i'll put the um put the uh, bezel and the dial back on and put it on facebook and for this little clock thank you again uh tosh and dell really sweet little clock and uh, i'll order up a couple of 2.5 millimeter cross flats keys now they'll be here next week oh, interesting in the design look how they've cut that pillar away um to clear the barrel teeth so when you reassemble and it's note to self make sure that that pillar goes back in the right place because the pillars are not riveted in the riveted in the frame so you need to um ah oh, harriet hi harriet Ah, I accidentally bought accidentally bought a mainspring letdown tool for a fusey pocket watch. Didn't know there was such a thing. Initially, I bet that would work. It probably would. They're all the same. So photographed in a white background, it's hard to tell. So quite know what are all the same. Um, clocks. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> they it beggars um. So yeah. So really pleased with this. It looks like the train is good um so far anyway we'll see next week when we get it apart so we've got a screw to make for the motion work we've got a some kind of friction um all ah, right okay so it is a little oval sprung washer there yeah i wasn't blaming you derek for losing the parts or breaking it um so that's great we'll just make a little brass washer uh good 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 look forward to that 
and um, get those keys ordered. Really nice. So yeah, uh, wear gloves when handling clocks. Um, you can see there, look at all the fingerprinting on this, which uh, etches the plate. Brass let down tools. Ah, oh, let down tools all look the same. Right, okay, cool. Oh well. Good to see you, uh, Harriet, from the uh, smoke. Um, went down there to see Harriet on Monday, which was great. Nice, proud dad moment. Um, thanks for joining us. So, yeah, there we are. We'll leave it at that. It's nearly half past. So we'll see you next week, I think. Again, we're in a bit of a clash uh, next week with Keith Scobie Young, which I'm, I'm sorry about that, Keith. Uh, I, he's talking about the work that he did on the great clock at Westminster. So I would watch that if I were you, because uh, I'm not sure it's going to be recorded. Um, but anyway, I'll be here and you can catch up with me later on the, uh, on the channel. So uh, massive thank you to Derek for sending this uh, little clock. Very pleased with that. Be good to see that going. I'll look online for a three train Enfield. Uh, clock um maybe we'll do that one next and i'll get those tools ordered so thanks everybody thanks to team open clock club has been sat here encouragingly and um we will see you again next week oh and don't forget um please keep us informed on facebook group of your projects that includes you harriet uh so if you've got a clock in bits on the bench just take 10 minutes more few snaps, a few thoughts about what you're doing. And it really encourages the other people to share those ideas. And I know sometimes there's a bit of backlash, but hey, ho, that's life for you. Anyway, thanks very much. And we'll see you again next week. Bye for now. <laughs>